And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were heads of the children of Israel. And they give the names of the twelve people, and so on. And they were sent out to spy out the land of Canaan. And uh, they came back, and this is what they said. They told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us, it truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. They come back with pomegranates, they come back with a huge bunch of grapes, so big that two men had to carry it on a pole. It was huge. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwelled in the land in the south and Hittites and so on. Uh, and, and they said, we can't do it. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. They could not go in. They could not go in because of unbelief. And the end of chapter 3 of Hebrews says this, you see. In verse 17, Now, with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now the question we have to ask is this, you see, what does Canaan represent? The promised land, what does it represent? Well, there are those commentators who say it's a picture of heaven. And they couldn't enter in, so they don't enter in. It's a picture of heaven. And indeed, one of our famous hymns says, When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. And so, for the writer, William Williams, to him too, Canaan was a picture of heaven. The problem is, when you read about Canaan, the first thing they did was to fight. They had Jericho, you see, and then they had to drive out all the other nations, the Hittites and the Jebusites and, 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 and so on, see. But I believe that Canaan represents possessing, as a Christian, what God has promised. We've come out from Egypt, we've come out from our unconverted state, and we're in Christ, and we have life, yeah. an everlasting life. And there God puts before us his way and everything that he's promised us. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he wants us to go on. To possess our possessions. And he's writing to see to these people, these Jewish believers who had come to faith in Jesus as Messiah, and they were in danger of not experiencing and receiving all that God had done for them in Christ. He says in verse 1 of chapter 4 therefore since a promise remains of entering his rest let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it in fact they were in danger of going back to their old religion because they had lost a great deal here they were they're, they're Jewish people and the Jewish people stick together and, and in their work and so on 
uh, and they would be in business with other Jews and when they became followers of Messiah they lost their business maybe some of their family turned against them uh, and, and uh, they lost many things and they said to themselves well is it worth following Jesus as Messiah is it worth pressing on and continuing on and they were in danger and that's why he's writing uh, and when you have to expound chapter 6 you're going to have real problems <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, if, if we can understand my pastor is to say <coughs> well, when I was converted if you can understand Romans and understand Hebrews you'll be a real theologian <laughs> well I can understand bits of Romans <laughs> and I can understand bits of Hebrews so I'm not a great theologian I have to tell you that see and this is a challenge it seems to me for us here for us here now see are we possessing all that there is for us in Christ that's the question you see that there, everything that God has for us is in Christ uh, uh, and uh, people talk about the simple gospel just preach the simple gospel that's what we need the ABC of the gospel but uh, there's much more than the ABC of the gospel uh, and to, to press on requires effort you see he says in, in verse 11 let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience now there are Bible teachers who say all that he's talking about here is the rest of salvation see we, when we come as we mentioned in the beginning works rest and all they're talking about here is, is the rest that we enjoy when we convert it and, and nothing more and the, these people were failing in that well I, I understand it to be a bit more than that than just the rest of salvation. I believe he's talking here about total commitment of ourselves to the Lord and it requires effort. Paul writes to see, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life, run the race with perseverance, looking unto Jesus to win the prize. Put off the old man and put on the new man. By the spirit, he says, mortify the flesh. As Christians now, we are not to be passive, but active. And the word of God will search us out. That's why he brings in here to see it at the end in verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrows and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart as we read the scripture the scripture reads us and, and, and it shows us whether we are really going on or whether we are just stagnant or whether we're just satisfied or whether we're pressing on to God remember the, the, that, those two verses that Jesus said I, I, I think they they sum up what, what we're trying to say here. In, in Matthew chapter 11, at the end of the chapter, these wonderful words that Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest, see, the burdens that they had were the, the, the burdens of, of legalism. Of, of Phariseeism and, and of the Jewish religion <coughs> and he says you come to me and I will give you rest from the burden of, of, of the condemnation that the law brings upon you then he goes on to say take my yoke upon you and learn of me in other words become a disciple now you see for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your soul See, there, there are two rests there. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when we come to faith, we, we stop trying hard to earn salvation and we find rest in Christ. But now we are his disciples and we have to follow him and we have to serve him 
And then every day, as we live the Christian life, we will find rest. We will find peace in our hearts. I, I want to turn to a, a little passage in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, and this is the prayer of the Apostle. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing. He, he prays, you see. Uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So he's praying now for us to have wisdom and insight and revelation in the knowledge of God. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. Who believe in Christ according to the working of his mighty power. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now I, I, could, I couldn't. For a while I couldn't understand that. He, here Paul, he, he, in the, the, the first verses in Ephesians 1, he, he's described what God has done for us. We have these wonderful blessings. We've been redeemed. We've been chosen. We've been adopted. And now he prays that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened. Well, well I thought when I was converted, my spiritual eyes had been opened. I knew that before I was converted, I, I was spiritually dead and blind and I didn't understand spiritual things at all. And then suddenly God worked in my heart and I could see these things. And yet Paul is praying here that the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. And, and I, I, I couldn't work it out for a bit. And, and then the, the sort of illustration that came to my mind was this. Now you notice that I don't wear glasses, you see. Uh, I'm this great age and I've got glasses, spectacles. Uh, by four girls, uh, but I don't wear them because they make me giddy. <laughs> by by four girls, I only wear them to watch television and they sharpen up things. See, but I don't don't wear them. So I've got very good eyesight. So here am I now. I went off to the forces. You see, when I was 18, <coughs> uh, and I, I was physically fit. I used to play football, so I was physically fit. And then uh, went in and had my eyes tested, and I could see what was there and I could read it all to almost the bottom line and then the man <coughs> opened a book big, bigger than this uh, and uh, there were all little circles of pastel shades you see on the page so he said sort of nonchalant to me uh, what, what, what numbers on that page he said uh, don't see any number oh I don't see any number and then he sort of traced a number number 12 and then I could just about make it out. Oh, he said, you're uh, slightly colorblind. So you won't fly, he said. You won't be a pilot. So you won't fly. See, I didn't realize that there was something wrong in my eyesight. I could see very clearly, but I was slightly colorblind. Now, I, I, I can tell colors. Of course, you, 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 you've got a black dress on there. And, no, you haven't. <laughs> no, no, you're red and orange. And, <laughs> but when, when it comes to, to that, maybe you had your eyes tested too, and maybe you've been colorblind. You see, so I could see okay, but there was a fault.